see you. 23 minutes to eight. Respect. It's a word we've heard a lot over the past week, whether it was politicians lamenting the lack of it or rioters demanding it or police and passers-by talking about it. It was the word on everyone's lips. They've got no respect for us. They're rude. I don't, I've rude. got no respect for them. That's why. And I wonder why youth go mad. We're going mad for the simple fact that you, you're not respecting us. When you respect us, we'll respect you back. Here in London, you had people who were behaving with a complete absence of restraint and a complete lack of respect for the police. Please respect the memory of our sons and the grief of our family and loved ones by staying away from trouble. Well, three completely different uses of the word respect there. Both our next guests agree that respect is a central notion for communities across the spectrum. Rapper Maestro, who grew up in West London, voices frustration about social inequality and abuse of power in his single Aquarius. And Professor Gus John is the former special advisor to Boris Johnson on serious street violence. A morning to you both. We've been asking our viewers this morning what respect means. Um, First of you, or you, Maestro, what does it mean for you, that particular word? Um, I mean, it, it, for me, it, it means, you know, obviously having respect for anybody, regardless of where they're from or who they are. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of, like, whether it's looking after people, opening the door for anybody, you know, sort of basic things like that. But I feel like, in a sense, um, it may have been sort of the value of the word may have been lost or... It feels like people only have respect now for their immediate family or immediate friends as opposed to anybody out there. But, you know, then we have to ask the question, why is that? Mm -hmm. Why do people feel like that? Gus, has the meaning changed and why is it so important? Well, I think the meaning, it, the meaning has not changed universally. Yeah. Uh, it, the word has been appropriated by particular groups, adults and young people, and used in, in all sorts of peculiar and bizarre ways. Why? I think largely because um, certainly for, for young people and particularly those involved in what's generally known as street culture, um, there, is, there is a sense that the society, the wider society does not respect them. As the young woman in the clip was saying, mm -hmm. the police don't treat them with respect. In, in many instances, adults with whom they interact don't treat them with respect. Some teachers don't treat young people with respect. And, and consequently, they demand it of others who are not as, as, as fortunate as themselves, in, in, in the sense that it, the, the word is used very much in, 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 in a, as a form of bullying. Um, mm. people, people demand it not because they, 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 they deserve it intrinsically, mm. but because they feel they can compel people, bully people, mm. To show them respect. Um, one of, I mean, we've had lots of um, contact from all our viewers this morning. Um, the sort of repeated message is that respect has to be earned in their view. So how do we change? How do we change what's going on? Perhaps in the well, does it, when people say that, does that mean that I don't have any respect for you? You have to earn it, or should I have as much respect for you as possible and allow you to well, then? Let, devalue yourself. Okay, well, you know? let, let, me, let me put so, sort of back up to those points. And one of our viewers says, if you want to respect, you work for it. You don't go around your area smashing things up and looting shops. That's how they're taking it on, some yeah. views at least. Well, that's fair enough, but this is out of frustration, obviously, because this would have happened, you know, last year or the year before. It, it's a case of, I think it's a, it's a build up of a lot of frustration and anger. And this is probably the only way they felt that it, they could be heard. And I think that, you know, the, the people that sort of lead the country should now feel, understand that they have to hear these people, they have to hear these children. And it's not just children, we all know that now. But they have to hear them now because it's being said, you know, in this sort of way. Mm. I, I, but I, you see, I think respect is, is something that we should all be able to presume, yeah? It's to do with courtesy, it's to do with good manners, it's to do with all of those values that make us fit for living in civil society. So it's, it's a question of how we ensure that, whether it be adults or young people, those behaviors mm. and those attitudes are imparted so that people feel a sense of being valued themselves mm. and, and valuing others. There, you're right. There, there is, I would argue there's a sense of certainly courtesy about respect, but there's also more to it in, in terms of sort of 
perhaps a sense of honor to somebody for what they have achieved and what they have done in their standing in society. And I just wonder, people might think that the woman in that first clip we said said, you know, we don't respect you because you don't respect us. Well, if you, you know, you, you, it's not just sort of something you can just chuck out there, surely, is it? It's, it's, you, know, it's just, you have to have done something. Yeah, but why, but why did she say that? What, when she said that, what do you think she meant? You don't respect us. So she's probably understood from the student riots, you know, the protests going on there, that, you know, the students already are not getting, the, they're not being heard. And then now this situation with Mark Duggan occurred, and, you know, obviously it started off as a, as a peaceful protest, but escalated and then has given... So you think it was her attitude to the policing of those student demonstrations in the sense she was referring to as well? Um, probably, yeah, it, it could add that as well. But I think, all in all, for a lot of children, they feel like they're not being heard. And then now, you know, they're on school holidays with no, nowhere to go, nothing to do. I think it's, I think, <laughs> I think it's, it's young people's sense that subservience is demanded of them and that they do not deserve respect in their own right. So it's, it's a form of bullying by authority in many mm -hmm. ways. And, and that their voices aren't heard, they're not, they not given the sort of respect that they should receive automatically, rather than, rather than um, people believing that somehow or other they should be prepared to stay in that place. Okay, let's leave it there, I'm afraid. Professor Gus John, thank, thank you very you. much. Maestro, our thanks to you. And thanks very much for all your um, emails, texts and all the rest of it this morning on that. Now, nearly 200,000 people have signed a petition calling for people convicted of looting to lose their benefits. The Liberal Democrats say that will only lead to an increase in theft, but ministers are drawing up the controversial plans. The Work and Pension Secretary Ian Duncan Smith is in our Westminster studio. Um, morning to you. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, let's deal with that first of all about uh, the fact that people are asking if they have been convicted in these riots that the people convicted should lose their benefits. Is that something you're actively considering and will do? Well, first of all, anyone that goes to prison, uh, gets a custodial sentence, will lose their benefits. That's been a fact of life. And there's already conditionality in the benefit system. So if you don't cooperate, i.e. if you're not prepared to look for a job or attend interviews or take the job that's given to you, then you will lose your benefits. There's already that conditionality. Uh, I am at the moment looking uh, at, uh, to see whether or not someone who's convicted of a criminal offence but not custodial uh, that we would be able to impose a, a similar uh, process on them as well, that they would lose their benefits for a particular period of time relevant to that process. And I'm inclined to believe that it's better if it's done through the judiciary rather than done straight as a, uh, by the department itself. Okay, uh, we are reading this weekend, you're saying that gang leaders' lives yeah. should be made hell. How will you do that and what do you mean by that? Well, first of all, that, that's a slightly narrow interpretation of what I was actually saying. Uh, the, 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 I published this report when I was at the Centre for Social Justice called Dying to Belong. Uh, we did a huge study of looking at what worked against the gangs in places like Boston, Cincinnati, and in New York, Los Angeles. We sent a team of people who are experts in gangs, uh, voluntary sector organisations, looked at Strathclyde here, in the UK, some parts of London, also Liverpool, and, and came to the conclusion that the way in which you deal with this is that you first of all accept you cannot arrest your way out of the street gang problem that we have. The most important thing you recognize is whilst the police have to be able to crack down on the ringleaders, the key guys at the top make their life miserable, nonetheless the key is that the politicians, the voluntary sector, the health sector and also education needs to spot the kids ahead of time, figure out who's going to be in the gangs, work with those that are in the gangs, try and strip out the younger ones, get them through remedial education into work programs, get them away, back into their schools. Uh, where it's been done like that, particularly successfully, I have to say, up in Strathclyde uh, in the UK, but also in Liverpool too, uh, Islington and London pretty good, uh, they've actually done very well in helping break down the structure of the gangs. And in my own area, Waltham Forest, I'm working with the Labour Controlled Authority there, Chris Robbins, to do just the same. But the problem is uh, that this isn't happening everywhere at the same time. And when you crack down in one area uh, and start to try this process of getting the kids out of the gangs, all that happens is you often displace them into other areas and then you know, they just go on as they are. It needs to happen everywhere at the same time for all the time. But the key thing is to try and rescue those kids out of the gangs because they're debilitating whole communities, they're destroying them, they're making it impossible for shops to set up, for businesses to come, for decent people to be on the streets, and they were hugely manipulating the criminality uh, uh, last week that we saw. 
Yeah, you, you talk about them hugely manipulating the criminality, but last week wasn't just about <coughs> gangs, was it? I mean, you just have to no. look at the people who've been convicted. That's true, but a huge amount of the, of the uh, organised rioting that was going on uh, was uh, initiated by the gangs. I know this because talking to my own borough commander of Waltham Forest where we've had real gang problems, murders, shootings, stabbings uh, in our area for a number of years now as we've tried to control it. But he said that there was literally a gang truce uh, and there's, there's plenty of evidence that they were swapping information about where to go. They were moving out of area uh, with other gangs as well. So a lot of the thing was initiated uh, by them as a pure process of trying to also rob shops. But, you know, there were hangers-on, we know that. Kids that went to watch, uh, they were drawn to the idea, they read the social websites, so they travelled over there. Uh, and the key problem for them is that a lot of them got swept up in what I call sort of crowd mentality and lost their own sort of moral compass. You know, they just saw shops, they robbed them, sometimes they started smashing windows, throwing bricks at police, got caught up in, uh, in, in uh, a sort of mob culture. And, and I spent time in Northern Ireland uh, I have dealt with gang uh, uh, and uh, crowd violence uh, and had to control it. And I've seen it before where uh, people who would normally not do that kind of thing get swept up uh, because the initiators create the environment and then they enter it. And they should know the difference between right and wrong. They shouldn't have done it. Uh, but that's the reason why many of them were caught up. And they'll face now the full penalties of the law. Work and Pension Secretary Ian Duncan-Smith. Thank you. Pleasure. 11 minutes to 8. Here's Carol with the weather.